Welcome to Compromising Positions. I'm Leanne Potter, cyber anthropologist and head of security operations for a major retailer. And I'm Jeff Watkins, cybersecurity enthusiast and CTO for a major tech consultancy. Together, we're the tech podcast that asks non-cybersecurity professionals what we in the industry can do to make their lives easier. And help make our organisations more prepared to face ever-changing human-centric cyber threats. In this episode, we're joined by Melina Palmer, a renowned keynote speaker in behavioural economics and the CEO of The Brainy Business, as well as hosting one of the best podcasts on the subject of the practical application of behavioural economics. In this episode, we'll discuss how silos and tribal mentalities occur in the workplace and how we can expand the circle of empathy to create a more cohesive team. We'll also delve into the issue of time discounting, why people are drawn to the easy option in the moment. We'll discuss how the cybersecurity team's curse of knowledge can be a barrier to effective communication and the need to create easy-to-digest content that enables buy-in. So if you're interested in understanding the behavioural science behind cybersecurity and how we can communicate more effectively, then you're in the right place. So sit back and enjoy part one of our interview with Melina Palmer, what the cybersecurity team want but can't tell you because they need more behavioural science. I am so excited about this. You're in for a treat, that's all I can say listeners. Today you are in for an absolute treat. Melina Palmer from the Brainy Business Podcast, author of What Your Customer Wants and Can't Tell You and What Your Employees Need and Can't Tell You, which I should know that I run a book club in my organization and it was one of the top choices this month of what to read next. So you're in good company if you if you like that sort of thing. Melina, can you introduce yourself to our listeners? Because apart from saying that you're amazing, great, that's not really useful. <laughs> so <laughs> go for it. I don't know. At least it's not a hindrance, right? It's not, it's a helpful intro, but thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. As you said, I host a podcast called The Brainy Business and am the CEO of a company of the same name. And it's all about understanding behavioral economics and how to apply it into businesses. And really where I work is helping people in business to make their communication more brain friendly so that customers buy and employees buy in. Brilliant. So the purpose of this podcast, uh, just to remind our listeners and also for yourself, is that cybersecurity don't really engage with lots of areas in the, the business. And uh, myself as a a cyber anthropologist is always interested in how cultures work and it stands to reason that actually behaviors is a huge part of cybersecurity. actually it's one of the main crooks one of the things we're always telling people is don't click on that don't do that please avoid these things and also put in controls in place that might hinder people from doing their job but we kind of need to do them to protect the organization so it seemed to me a really natural train of thought to bring someone like yourself in who can really focus on the behavioral science side of it. So what is behavioral science? Can you tell me a little bit, you know, what does it look like for someone who practices in this area? You know, what in behavioral economics, like how how does that work in the real world? How not in academia? Yeah, well, for me, I actually my undergrad is in marketing and I did that work for for a while. Uh, While I was in my undergraduate studies, I had one section of one book that had a little tiny thing in one of my classes about buying psychology and why people do the things they do, why they buy the things they buy. And I thought it was fascinating. And for yourself, you know, as an anthropologist, understanding like this human behavior thing is super cool. And in this case, you know, understanding understanding buying decisions was just amazing to me. And at that point, I hadn't really been thinking about further education. I'm a first generation college student in my family. And so master's degrees and doctorates wasn't really on my mind. But I realized like, oh, man, I want to go get a master's in this. I was so excited about it. And uh, like I spent 10 years calling schools around the US and asking them about what programs they had. And they all said it wasn't a thing. And it didn't exist and it wasn't there. <laughs> and I was like, what? What are we talking about? Like, right. So like, I did read this, didn't I? I did read this. <laughs> right. I know. I've had so many people over the years say, like, do you remember what the book was? And say, like, I wish I remember what the book was. I actually remember the class and I know who the professor is. So, but you know, been a, a few years now. So I don't think I could go back and ask him. But <laughs> with that, having I, I just ended up working in industry and I was in uh, running a marketing department and was in a program that I could basically just describe as like an innovation fellowship. And they brought in some 
some people from the Center for Advanced Hindsight at Duke University who were talking about the research they were doing. And they said it was called behavioral economics. And I said, okay, um, now I know what to go look for, right? And I found myself a master's degree. And as far as what it means and how it works, like I knew I was early because I had spent 10 years looking for a program that people told me didn't exist. And the academic side has actually been around for, for decades. It's being built on all sorts of really amazing research across multiple fields. And I found that on the applied side, at the time that I started my degree, there was really nothing, none of the research, the textbooks, like really not much that was around that was about how you actually use this in a company. And things that were really clear and obvious to me about how this applies to communication and whether it's interpersonal at work or you're talking to your customers and messaging and brand strategy and all this just didn't really exist anywhere. And so I had a friend... Uh, or was introduced to someone who I'd say is now a friend that had a podcast, a very successful one. And she said to me, I will never, ever forget, said, I never tell anyone ever to start with a podcast. And like you now having one know why. <laughs> <laughs> I would never, I never tell anyone this, but you have to go do this yesterday was what mm. she said. And so said, okay. And uh, the brainy business was born. So that was a super roundabout explanation on some of that. But essentially, behavioral economics matters because we all have brains, even though there's a lot happening with AI and machine learning and things in organizations. At the end of the day, the vast majority of your employees are humans and the customers, members, clients, whatever you have are also people, human people with brains. And if you can communicate with them in a way that is more likely uh, going to work with how their brain works instead of how you think it should, it's just always going to make things easier for everyone. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm very thankful for that friend of yours for pushing you into podcasting. <laughs> yes. And one thing uh, when you were talking, it just kind of made me think is when I've read about behavioral economics, there is sometimes a little bit of pushback about the fear of behavioral economics, about it being too much influence. But, you know, if the outcomes are good, then where, where do you draw the line of actually how much is almost like big brother influence and how much is, you know, actually making people make the right decisions? When people think about behavioral science sometimes and, and behavioral economics, they sometimes think actually, is this a force for good or is this a force for, for example, in your world, marketing it doesn't always have the greatest rap in terms of coercion into behaviors and things like that. What would you say to that? Yeah, I, I'm sure you can appreciate that in every, almost every presentation I do will say probably more, definitely more than half, maybe, you know, 70% or something. Uh, someone ends up asking about, is it manipulation? They ask about ethical applications, which of course are incredibly important. And the thing I always say, and my approach to this is that on the one side being like, all information can be used for evil in the wrong hands, right? So we've seen this over and over again for all time. And actually, a lot of people that are tend to have bad intent kind of have intuited some of these things over the years anyway. And so being able to let everyone else know how the brain really works, I think, is a, is a helpful approach uh, in that way. The other thing is, whether you think about it or not, what has been found over time through behavioral economics, behavioral science research, is the way you present information absolutely has an impact on the decision that someone makes. So whether you think about it or not, whether you want the responsibility or not, whether you do anything up front, you are influencing the choice that someone is going to make. And in my opinion, it's always better mm -hmm. to be thoughtful about it. <laughs> And, and do what you can. And people also always have free choice within the field of behavioral economics. So you're not forcing anything on anyone. And it's also not hypnosis. It's not magic. I, yeah, I read something very similar. I mean, very basic stuff, but in, in Nudge talking about the fact that the options architecture was actually, this was happening anyway. And people realized that by not doing it in, in an informed way, they were getting a worse outcome. So using it in ethical ways to get an, what is, you'd say is an objectively good outcome seems like a, a sort of a win-win. <laughs> in your time in the business, I mean, how much um, exposure have you had to um, security teams? So the time I had in industry, as I say there, uh, so I was running the marketing department of a financial institution for six years. And I've also done consulting for all sorts of organizations over the years. So you talk about like regulated industry, gotcha. <laughs> And making sure your messaging is um, aligning with all sorts of rules and things like that. And, you know, I know that sometimes these organizations, all sorts, whether it's financial institutions or otherwise, companies tend to get siloed really quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. And you get 
camps within a company. And it's also, it's kind of a weird, I, I would say it's like a, a herding and tribal mentality that we get where it's just sort of saying like always like marketing and finance don't like each other. Compliance doesn't like sales. Compliance doesn't like marketing. Marketing doesn't like compliance. And it has to be this like aggressive approach, mm -hmm. like a them versus us, which is very natural in the way that our brains are wired. And it just doesn't have to be that way. Um, there's lots of good research. We can talk about this in more depth if you were wanting to. I talk about it a lot in what your employees need and can't tell mm -hmm. you about uh, overcoming that us versus them. But you know, you can expand the circle of empathy and be team company and know that everyone's trying to achieve the same thing. The person in compliance or, you know, securities, whatever the terminology is in the industry or company you're in, isn't out against you, right? <laughs> Everybody's trying to do the same thing. And if we can have thoughtful communication, uh, it can actually make it to where you have positive relationships with those people and are able to get some, you know, a little bit of give and take and find finding the gray area and stuff, because even from what I have found, you know, there's lots of interpretation that comes into these sorts of rules and things. And even if someone is on an extreme, you cannot find some ground in the middle if you're willing to put in the effort of having a positive relationship and conversation. Absolutely. And I think that's so important. What what I've quite liked about doing this podcast so far is actually hearing people, other people go, well, you know, you think security is going bad, but you know, I hate this team as well. And I hate this team or I don't get on with this team. And actually, it's quite nice. Sometimes um, I feel like as a sort of cyber security practitioner that like, oh, everyone really doesn't like the kind of work we're doing and things like that. But actually to hear that, yeah, well, you've not seen nothing yet, but there's this other team as well. They, they also don't play nice. But one thing that I was really kind of drawn to what you're saying there, could you explain a little bit more? or expand on the circle of empathy. Oh, sure. Yeah. So when we think about, again, the, the tribe, so we humans are a herding species. And so we are programmed, essentially, to be finding people like us and bonding with them. And there's safety in the group. And we are constantly doing that. And there are some amazing books out. I really love uh, The Power of Us by Jay Van Babel and Dominic Packer. And uh, in that, you know, talking about how we are constantly shifting in diff into different identities throughout the day and it impacts the way we behave, right? So me as a, how I show up as mom is different than wife, is different than podcaster, is different than when I'm giving a keynote or when I'm consulting, right? And so these things, even then too of like, super nerd Harry Potter fan. Like I show up maybe a little bit differently when someone's like, I'm in Ravenclaw too. Like, yeah, right. Maybe a little different than I do in other interactions, though. I definitely talk about Harry Potter on the podcast and I've done it on stage. So, you know, I have clocked uh, it. I have clocked it. <laughs> <laughs> I know the lines blur a bit. And so with that, though, your identity will change throughout the day. And you think about uh, a team and often within companies looking at this, you know, we will say this is marketing and you do things that you're trying to build camaraderie within the organization. It's like, OK, we're going to have marketing as a team and sales as a team and finance as a team and you're all competing against each other. And then we wonder why people have these reinforced tribal mentalities of us versus them. And so if you do have issues with silos like that and you have teams that are fighting, often it's because you don't see that person as another person. They're they're a them and not an us. And so expanding who you define as us can help people to then see those other humans as real humans as they are. So again, defining then as team company and you can still make it so you have little competitions and things throughout the organization, but you want to be more like random assignment of people and making sure you have a depth and a breadth across the organization and maybe having new groups in a, you know, once a quarter or something that you're able to then have affinities that are built up. We all have so much in common. And so if you get to see like, wow, we both love Harry Potter. I didn't even know that that would be a thing since it seems like we're so different. And so those sort of pieces of bringing people together and expanding who you see as part of team us can really go a long way. Oh, I love, I love that actually. Um, it's sort of firing loads of other, other questions. Like, mm. do you think that is something that can be, that doesn't then mentality, can it be challenged at all levels or is that a top down kind of mentality that we're going to have to start saying to 
uh, CEOs and things like because th- th- there's obviously a way that a business looks, which is obviously I need a department and I need them to achieve certain outcomes. And therefore, yes, that's why we have a marketing department. That's why we have finance. That's why we have tech, for example. It makes sense on you know the cost sheet to have those in different areas and budgeted appropriately. But when we've all got a common goal, yeah, you're right. It doesn't really meet our needs in that sense. I think a lot of other organizations as well almost have like kind of an Anne Rand, Anne Rand style model of that they've got their own competing PL, their own revenue targets, and, and effectively they are creating internal competition, which I imagine is in, in organizations quite a struggle. Yeah, I do appreciate it. I think you're going to say Anne Randian, and that's like my new, that's happening. I'm going to make that into a term if it isn't already. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so to answer, uh, the, the initial piece there too, is really anytime you can have top down influence, it's going to be important and helpful across an organization. So if you say, Hey, we don't believe in silos and that's really not being reinforced and the worst sort of culprits are at the top, then you have incentives that are built where it is amazing how often you end up with competing incentives to where one for one department to win, another department has to lose. And that sucks. It's not good for anybody. And you can't then have that sort of harmonious approach where the company is able to flourish and grow when you're pitting departments against each other like that, right? And often people don't even realize, you know, where you would say, uh, maybe it's something along the lines of, you know, sales gets incentivized by the number of items that they sell to people. And nobody cares how those items end up in a bag or whatever it is. And I know from, you know, stories from interesting, really bad examples over the years, like doesn't matter they get incentivized by clicking the button, by adding the thing. And then you also have, you know, customer service is gets only gets their incentives and payouts by uh, having a lot of call volume. And maybe they're going to be hanging up on people or maybe it's something else like as things that's happened. And then the satisfaction scores go down, which impacts the, the other department. Right. And so like, where and they feel like they can't win because no matter what they do, if this other area is not doing something that's in support, they're kind of stuck. And then in that us them, it's like, well, if they're doing that, we might as well do this. And it can just really become a terrible problem very, very quickly. Whereas if you at the top can look and say, hey, what sort of incentives, like what are the hidden incentives here? What are the things we're able to put together for payouts or whatever it is that you do to line it up so that everybody's working toward the same goal and you're looking for ways that they can be working together. Just a simple shift like that, that it's like we either all win or none of us do and we're all in this together can be a really big impact from that top level down. That being said, if that's not your role (laughs) and you don't want to feel like there's nothing that you can do to help influence any of this. So what I would say is, like I said, at my uh, financial institution when I was there, It had always been sort of, you know, I was told when I came in that it was like, oh, this person is difficult to work with. They don't like us. Don't do that. Don't worry about them. I hate going into a (laughs) brand new organization and people doing that. I really do because making your own opinions on things is so important. You might come to the same opinion, but um, as soon as someone puts that that single seed in your head, that's it. It taints your relationship. There's no way that that person, it's unfair on that person. There's no way they can come back from that. And you know they're going to do it about you as well eventually. Right, <laughs> right, for sure. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. Don't they're saying something. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, And with that, so we actually, so we have a confirmation bias, we have a focusing illusion. And so if you go in thinking like, yikes, Melina's really difficult, that's going to be a problem. And there's really interesting research even showing for like elementary school teachers that were told these this student's kind of a bad egg, got to watch out for them. And this student is amazing and a stellar superstar. They reinforced the stars who ended up doing very well and had a not so great interaction with some of these other students. And there was actually nothing different about those kids. The ones that were reinforced and got that positive association did better than those who didn't. And, you know, that has an impact. So when we interact with people and we have a conversation, if you're looking for the positive space, those interactions of where you have connection points, you're really listening to people. There's, and I don't want to say, you know, I guess there may be some examples where it can't be everyone, but there's almost always an opportunity to have a good relationship with someone. It doesn't, they don't have to become your best friend or anything, but 
people being listened to and being heard and being appreciated really goes a long way. And you don't have to hold that. Like you were saying, like, there's no coming back from that for that person, but it, it doesn't have to be quite that dire. You have the choice to go in and be looking for what's positive there. And I teach a class on internal communication and change management that really became a lot of the foundation of the What Your Employees Need book. And always I will have a student that will, when we talk about confirmation bias, that says, oh man, I'm so glad that you brought this up. Like, how can I convince my employee that they're seeing this wrong and they're, they're focusing on the wrong thing? <laughs> Just like, well, First thing is, where's your confirmation bias? Like mm -hmm. going in and trying to prove to someone that they're wrong really never goes over very well. Um, but again, when we interact with someone and if someone said like they're always difficult and you're just fil your brain's going to be filtering for what's difficult with that person and you can shift your mindset to say this is someone who really cares right? Or maybe it's somebody who's interested in something like, why are they this way? You ask some thoughtful questions, invest in learning about them, and it can go a really long way. So like I said, when I started at the organization, I had someone say, they're out, we don't like them, we don't like them, <laughs> they're not good, they're difficult. And I chose to have, you know, my own opinion about it and go to meet people and be open and ask good questions. And, you know, one of those people has become a good friend of mine over the years, and we worked very, very well together. Um, she was the head of the lending department. Also, you know, it's like CFO, doesn't get along with marketing and I, we were friendly and got to, you know, have good relationships over the years showing like, I care about the numbers. I care about the goals. We're working toward the same thing. How might we do this? You know, asking good questions and same with compliance. There were some things that you would see where in the States in, uh, I was in a credit union and we have NCUA, you know, insurance, mm -hmm. uh, it's like FDIC, right? And the actual rule at the time was that you, cause you have to put the NCUA logo on stuff that has to do with deposits and it, yeah. they have like tiny, 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 tiny writing underneath the logo talking about the limits on the insurance, uh, for the insurance. Yeah. And what the reg actually says is that this has to be your smallest font on your poster or whatever your billboard that you have cannot be smaller than the smallest font on their logo, the NCUA logo. And that font is a small and in a way that you wouldn't be able to read anything on a billboard if it's not that way. And so you will see a lot of financial institutions that have this giant NCUA logo on it because often that's interpreted as, well, we have to do it this way. And if you continue to read, it says, unless you say the line federally insured by NCUA, like you can still <laughs> say that in your disclosure. And if you write that line, then you don't have to have this giant thing. I still like to have the NCUA logo a lot of the time because that imagery helps people to feel safe. There's there's value in that, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be the size of my billboard to be able to meet the requirements, right? And so often I know people in the industry, it's like, well, my compliance, they, they won't let me, they say it has to be this. And say, well, have you tried actually talking to them and looked at the thing together? And like, they come to the conclusion and say, oh, like, so this says this, can we do this? And it works out, right? I didn't have to have a big giant logo <laughs> on my my pieces. And it helps find that balance to where they feel good about it. I feel good about it. We found that gray area or the like middle ground, I guess it's not even a gray area. It's a very mm -hmm. specific written thing, but the most prominent piece is something people would focus on that's really extreme, <laughs> not helpful. Yeah, totally. As you're talking there, I was just thinking, I think she's cracked i think she's cracked why people um have this negative sort of perception of security teams and i think it is because you know there are a few security teams that are not very friendly not very approachable do say no a lot and so if you take that experience of a department that's always saying no and then you take it to your next organization as soon as you engage them you're automatically going to draw upon that confirmation bias that this is not a team that i enjoy connecting with and then that kind of relationship perpetuates so when you were talking about that i was like oh, she's cracked it she's cracked it <laughs> <laughs> i was like so we just need to just follow your advice on how we kind of lead with our own thoughts and opinions rather than just kind of falling into that confirmation bias piece but it did yeah. bring me on to my next question so you've got two 
brilliant books out at the moment what your customer wants and can't tell you and what your employee needs and can't tell you um so from a security perspective we've got kind of two customers so we've got our actual customers you know maybe the thing people are buying things access accessing the organizations we're working for service and then we've also got our employees and the organization to protect and our messaging kind of seems to be off really regardless if it's for our customers or it's for our employees and it's kind of strange that because our security principles haven't really changed in decades really so you know things like you know have a good password don't overshare don't click on that all that kind of thing that messaging has kind of been consistent nothing's really changed for that but we still find people doing all those things you know having bad passwords you know do clicking on things do oversharing it makes me think what can we do to improve our message and why isn't it working yeah, so there are a couple things at play here as everything is more complex than we would sometimes like it to be. But one, the first thing is my one of my very favorite concepts is one of framing and that how we say something matters more than what we say. Uh, so that's a thing to keep in mind and I'll get into more detail on these in a minute. But the other, the next piece is that our brains get overwhelmed really, really easily. And when you give people a lot of data and facts and figures and numbers and explanation about stuff that's not really boiled down to the point, which kind of gets back to the framing again. But if you're in the easy kind of example, people say of like someone asked for the time and you told them how to build the watch, um, approach <laughs> <laughs> and like the history of time and all of these other things and like how watches were invented and all this like other stuff that's not really important I, I have to... I have met that person before <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, yeah we 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 all know the, some of those people <laughs> and they are spread in all areas of organizations that happens right but that then and you expect and like I told them like you told them and it was one piece of something where you were talking for an hour and it was one sentence that mattered like that can get lost because we get it's overwhelming distracting and also our brains are built on habit and the way we've always done things and the quickest easiest things we're supposed to be doing like so something like a password with this it needs to be complex you can't write it down anywhere you have to have different ones for everything it should be something that no one can guess so it can't be a phrase or it can't be something that's like a, a word that has symbols in it that still looks like a word but that's like how am I supposed to remember them and so I'm going to default to the easy thing because if if I mess up I'm going to get locked out of my computer the availability bias the like what happens most often and what we commonly would see isn't that bad right I don't mm -hmm. typically have the issue and the consequence of forgetting my passwords and having to bug somebody all the time and not being able to make my meeting on time and my boss getting mad at me and all these things that could happen feels heavier than the likelihood that mm -hmm. someone's going to have a breach or something like that. Right. That's kind of a logic that can come into our mind. Even things like then if we look at so like my computer and you know my iphone and whatever will recommend strong passwords for me all the time it's like don't worry you don't have to remember it but where does it go like where do i find it if it's not this and how do i ever unlock it if i never knew it and like you know it but i don't know it like is this safe i don't know mm -hmm. and i start to like question everything and <laughs> you have this like i'm just gonna default to the easy password again on this one because it's just for I don't know, something simple. Mm -hmm. And I'll deal with that later because it feels really big and overwhelming and it's easier to go back to the, the habit of what we've done, right? And so even something as simple as explaining how, and like for those on the securities team, right? The, they pr probably know how that works <laughs> and know mm -hmm. that that's safe and why it is safe and where it goes, how you find it. I don't know that. And it's just assuming that I will trust that it's safe. But you've also told me to question anything that tells me it's too easy and safe. And so it feels <laughs> like <laughs> this is a little stress pile and I don't want to look dumb. So I just will be like, well, I don't want to tell anybody. Right. And so, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it says it's a bit of a curse of knowledge problem for the security team. They, they assume, I imagine that it wouldn't come naturally to people to explain that um, a, a password manager is actually a very secure piece of technology. But you know, as a user, you just go, I don't want anything saving my passwords. Right. Where And where, where is it? Where, where do I even find it? Even when, and I've tried where my phone or my Mac will say like, Hey, use this secure thing. And I, I try to say like, where in the moment, 
when it's offering it, I can't really find out about how good it is or where that's being kept or what I'm supposed to do or how I find it again and what happens if I missed it or whatever. And so I may think, all right, I'm going to just do my own thing now, but I'll look it up before the next time I need another password because we also suffer from something called time discounting. And it's like, Right now, I'm going to do the easy thing. I'm going to deal with this thing a little bit later. Uh, but we have optimism bias. We think we're going to do it, but we don't. And then the next time the password comes up, you keep doing the same thing over and over again. And so all of behavioral science, behavioral economics, and the work I do with my clients, you know, it's really the heart of it is take a step back. Like you said, considering your own curse of knowledge, get into that mind space of the person you're communicating with. What are they trying to achieve? Have some empathy for where they are and what might really be happening. And this is where understanding these concepts of behavioral science make it a lot easier to start to see like, okay, so we've got an overwhelm issue. There's too much information that's coming in. We have habits we're having to work against. What's the habit that they have around passwords? What's the easy rule that the brain might have for them? What might be happening in this case? In the way that we're presenting the information, are we talking about it in the right way? Or maybe we could frame this a little bit differently because again, how you say something has really, really great impact. And when we think about So you may say, you know, in your role in in securities or or whatever, uh, compliance, wherever you are, that you don't have anything to do with sales. You're not a salesperson. And I bet many people listening have said that before. That's not my job, right? That's not what I do. Like they either get it or they don't. Like it's, I can list the way it's written or whatever, but you still need someone to buy in on whatever idea you're selling them whether or not money is exchanging hands. And really, if you're trying to get someone to change, what your employees need and can't tell you is all about understanding how our brains respond to change, how to present information to make it so it's easier for them to buy in on whatever you're talking with them about. And Mm. so if you are presenting the information in a way that someone's not picking it up, it may be easy to say, well, they they messed up. I told them like I did. I did my job. That's on them after this because I gave them a 300 page document and they should remember uh, something that was on page 27 or whatever. But isn't it kind of your job to help ensure and like in the best way possible to help someone to know what matters to them, why it matters and help them along the path in and that's across the board in all of any role of Mm. what anybody's doing. Melina's right, you know, we do need to help people along the path. It reminds me of the threat modeling activities I do. I'm trying to introduce them at the product level because that's where I think they have the most impact. Because the user experience is so essential. I think we can frame our security discussions around what a user needs and wants and try to create security controls and meet them at that point. Absolutely. And compromising position bingo strikes again with things like empathy. And just speaking to understand the big whys, like why aren't my messages landing? Why can't I get buy-in from others in this message? And why won't anyone come? to be sooner. And I think approaching these questions from a behavioral science perspective, like Melina is helping us with, can really help us begin to unpack this. And I'm really looking forward to part two of our discussion with her. I mean, there's so much to talk about. Oh, me too. So listeners, do follow us on your podcast platform of choice via or via our YouTube channel so you don't miss part two. It's not about the cookie. Links to everything we discussed in this episode can be found in the show notes. And if you like the show, please do leave us a review and share on LinkedIn or in your teams. It really helps us spread the word and get high quality guests like Melina on future episodes. We hope you enjoyed this episode. See you next time. Keep secure. Don't forget to ask yourself, am I the compromising position here?